Good morning, everyone. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Thanks so much for joining us for a new installment of our series, Illinois Authors. And we're really delighted today to be joined by one of the prolific and insightful authors in Illinois, Dick Simpson. Let me tell you a little bit about Dick. Um, Dick is from Houston uh, originally, Houston, Texas. Uh, went to the University of Texas where he had an undergraduate degree, did graduate work uh, at the University of Indiana, did some really interesting research in African issues, Sierra Leone in particular, moved to Chicago in the late 60s, 1967, and began a just a remarkable teaching career at the University of Illinois, Chicago, where he taught for more than half a century, lots of really important students and, and inspired students. Um, he, uh, but it also has been involved in the political world. He was an alderman in Peoria, the 44th Ward, um, from 1971 through 79. I said Peoria, I'm in Chicago. And um, he has, uh, he ran for Congress. We'll talk about that a little bit. And he has either written or co-written 20 books. And we're going to discuss three of those today. Um, the first one is called A Good Fight, which was his memoir, memoir written in, excuse me, 2017. Uh, then we have um, Democracy's Rebirth, published in 2022, and then a book that was published just this year called Chicago's Modern Mayor. So lots of interesting topics to talk to Dick about, who's joining us uh, from Chicago. So Dick, good morning. Good morning, John. Well, let's talk about, uh, you know, when I was reading about you, I've always associated you so completely with Chicago that I was kind of startled to to learn that you grew up in Texas, not that there's anything wrong with that, but uh, but tell us about, uh, I know you moved to Chicago in 67, I think for the uh, the teaching job at the University of Illinois Chicago, but tell us about um, your your first impressions with Chicago and 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 how that sort of captured you and and kind of pulled you in for for all these years. So uh, when I was at Indiana University doing graduate work, uh, we came up a few times to see friends in Chicago and saw Old Town, which was sort of the hippie area of uh, Chicago at the time, and those kind of tourist things. Uh, then I went to Africa, as you suggest, to do research in Sierra Leone. And when we came back, my advisor, um, I wrote my advisor from Africa because in 67, the cities were going up in flames, there were riots. And I wrote my advisor and gave him a list of 10 cities and said, get me in a job in one of them, maybe I can be helpful. Uh, I got the uh, interview request from UIC, University of Illinois, Chicago, did the one interview, and then I stayed 55 years. Um, it uh, was a different time where we didn't have a doubt that we were going to get a job. Uh, it was we had much more of a choice of what job where we wanted to be. When I came to Chicago, I came right on the cusp of the Democratic National Convention, uh, the famous 1968 police riot convention. And uh, by the time we got here in 67, it was the fall. We went. Uh, my wife and I went to the third party convention that was being held in town, and later I became involved in the McCarthy for President campaign, first as uh, head of the uh, campaign manager for the 5th Congressional District uh, delegates, and then later I uh, became uh, a manager for the entire state of Illinois. Uh, and at the same time, I was starting my teaching career and I was teaching the standard American government course, but also African politics. As I stayed in Chicago and become, became much more involved in local Chicago politics and saw it uh, from the inside out, from the combat with the Richard J. Daley forces in the precincts, um, I switched over and began teaching urban politics. So. Most of my career has been American and urban politics uh, classes with occasional forays in other areas. Well, in your memoir, you say, of the four dimensions of my life, politics, love, religion, and teaching, it is teaching that has been my mainstay. Above all, I am a teacher, whether in classroom, on TV, or in political battles. And then you go on to write, you say, teaching politics is controversial because politics by its nature involves conflict between political parties, candidates, and groups. The best way to get students to learn is to put controversy before them and let them choose for themselves. 
So talk a little bit about just the vocation of teaching and particularly teaching politics and, and the focus on um, and, and encouraging your students to kind of be in the arena and be part of the, the process in its real world applications. Well, one of the courses I've taught since uh, 1976, in which you still taught, in fact, I'm going to do a guest lecture in uh, tomorrow, is uh, Chicago's Future. Um, and what we did in that class um, was to bring in different uh, political uh, people and urban scholars who had conflicting ideas about, uh, for instance, a uh, Frequently, we bring in Alderman Burke, who was just convicted of corruption to speak for the machine. I would bring in uh, Republicans from the Republican Party of Cook County, as well as uh, reformers and, and urban scholars who had different issues with the racial politics, uh, the racial conditions of Chicago. Uh, in my other course, in the American government course, what I did was uh, have the students read firsthand uh, political philosophy, uh, including some that aren't usually thought of as philosophy, like Plunkett of Tammany Hall as machine boss in New York, talking about raw machine politics and its theory of democracy, but also the Declaration of Independence, uh, Karl Marx and the Communist Manifesto, the Students for Democratic Societies, Port Huron Statement, Edmund Burke, the famous conservative um, philosopher, and so as I used to joke with the students, you know, if they were going to try and, and agree with all these people, their brain will become whipped cream. You can't. You have to make a choice. Do I believe with Jefferson or do I believe with Plunkett? Do I believe Karl Marx? Do I believe Students for Democratic Society? Do I believe Edmund Burke? You have to sort out for yourself and, and you can borrow from different philosophies. Um, but you have to make a choice. I also... Uh, for instance, in the Chicago's Future class, uh, the paper was very different. I don't know that anyone else in the state or the country assigns this as a paper, but their job was to pretend they were part of the transition team for the mayor and to study a department of government. Uh, first of all, they found out that getting, particularly in the earlier years, getting documents on city departments uh, was a Herculean task just to get the information. Uh, when I was alderman, you had to take a yellow pad and a pencil and go to the comptroller's office and copy it. And I was a public official, not a citizen had much worse chance. Um, so as they did all of these things, they became immersed in the way uh, government actually works. And they began to debate among their friends and in class, you know, which should we follow? Which, which of these ideas is worth our allegiance? And I found that that kind of conflict sharpened them. Uh, as you suggest, many of my students went on. Carol Mosley Bond became US Senator and ran for president. Uh, dozens and dozens of my students have held public office, both Republicans and Democrats. Great. Well, let's talk a little bit about your, your time as alderman. You were alderman in the 44th Ward from 71 to 79. Uh, uh, Mayor Daley, the first Mayor Daley, was still still in office, still uh, still pushing a, a, a powerful machine through uh, Chicago. Um, and tell us about just that experience, the 44th Ward, and also that the innovation you did with, with in which you had a, 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 a an award assembly that apparently guided you in, in, in your voting. So talk about the ward, the city, the, the battles with uh, Mayor Daley, and then also the, the particular innovation you did with the uh, the assembly. So the battles with the machine and the city council were quite fierce. Um, for instance, I opposed the appointment of the floor leader's son uh, to the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, because it was both nepotism and a conflict of interest since he worked for the largest real estate company in uh, Chicago. Um, and on that vote, not so unlike other votes, uh, the vote final vote was 44 to two. We didn't win the vote, uh, but uh, uh, raising these issues, we were essentially playing to the gallery. We were trying to get Chicagoans to think about doing government a different way than the old machine way with the, the party boss uh, like Richard J. Daly. 
And in the 44th Ward, we did an experiment in participatory democracy, which is one of the main um, things that I argue for in the Democracy's Rebirth book. Uh, we had, in the 44th Ward at the time, we had 64 precincts. And so we elected uh, delegates from each precinct and alternates from each precinct, two from each precinct, and then one from each community organization in the ward. So there were about 200 delegates. We met monthly. Um, we would, uh, I was staffed by my aldermanic staff. They would bring in the information. The board assembly would debate it in committee first and then before the entire assembly. And whenever they voted by two thirds vote, uh, then I would uh, carry that out. Either we would do it in the ward where we didn't need legislation or I would vote that way on the issues before the city council. And it worked marvelously well. We had about a thousand people participate each year, uh, either in electing delegates or in attending the ward assembly or the, we later created additional bodies, community zoning board to deal with zoning or development, traffic review commission to deal with traffic and parking, an assembly abierta, uh, which uh, was conducted in Spanish uh, so that the uh, Latino community, which was then substantial in the 44th Ward, could have a full voice in directing the policies, uh, both of, of me as alderman, but we would undertake, for instance, lawsuits against the uh, CTA to force them to hire uh, more Latinos who, who were being locked out of employment in the Chicago Transit Authority, the public transportation system here. Well, let's talk for a couple of minutes about your uh, your your primary challenge with Dan Rostenkowski, both in 92 and 94. Rostenkowski was a chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, this powerful figure in Washington. Um, you ran against him in a Democratic primary and you, you know, raised the question of character and, and ethics as front and center. Um, in the first run, you got 43 percent of the vote, which is a stunning amount for uh, you know challenging an incumbent like Rosenkowski. I mean what how do you how do you recall those uh particularly the first race against Rosenkowski? Yeah, you're right. I came within 12,000 votes of defeating Rosenkowski in the first election. Um and Rosenkowski was the most powerful member of um uh, of Congress uh, at the time, uh maybe other than the speaker of the house. Um so, but he was also corrupt. Uh, there were dozens and dozens of corruption charges. He would eventually be convicted of corruption in federal court and end up in federal prison. Um, and the argument for Rostenkowski as well, sort of he may be a crook, but he's our crook. He brings home the bacon to Chicago. And there were also particularly issues about senior citizens. He had neglected the senior citizens and had uh, voted for some reductions in the Social Security. Um, so he almost lost that election. Uh, if I'd had $100,000 more or 100 more volunteers, um, or if, uh, of course, the scandal had ended up in federal court sooner, uh, I would have won and become congressman. Hmm. Well, Dick, let's talk a little bit about um... Some some terms that I think are kind of relevant for your career. Um, you know, initially when you entered the political arena, you were referred to as as an independent. You've been referred to as a liberal. Um, you've been referred to as a progressive. Do those three terms mean the same thing? And what is say the essence of a progressive? Is it just a view that an activist government can improve the lives of people? What, what is the essence of being a progressive? So um, back in the day when I was first alderman, uh, or even when we worked uh, after the McCarthy campaign, after we uh, lost overwhelmingly, uh, the Daily Forces won 114 seats at the Democratic Committee Convention. We won four in the entire state. And some were people like Adlai Stevenson, which we could hardly claim credit for winning uh, his position as delegate. Um, so we were crushed in the sense that in the 9th Congressional District, where I was a campaign manager, we got only 20% of the vote, but we got in some of the wards as much as 40% of the vote, and we went on to then win those wards. 
uh, there had never been an independent, as they were called in the day, elected in those uh, lakefront liberal wards in Chicago. And so in the city council, we were called independents. We might have been called independent uh, Democrats, but we coalesced with Republicans and even conservative um, people uh, who had different views on race than we did. Uh, our total opposition at the high point was seven. Uh, at the low point, it was three. And the way we used to define it was very simple. Anybody that didn't believe in the omnipotence of Mayor Daley was our ally. Um, so the dividing line was pro-Daley, anti-Daley, essentially. The other term that was used was reform. And Harold Washington would use that when he ran for mayor. And he meant reform in three different ways. He first meant good government reform, like the Lakefront Liberals of League of Women Voters might mean, an end of corruption, fair and honest government, uh, services at the cheapest price for the citizens, um, efficiency, those kinds of reforms. The second was uh, at the time Chicago was still uh, very racially segregated, even in its city governance. Um, and so it meant um, affirmative action. It meant uh, uh, affirmative action in city jobs, affirmative actions in city contracts, uh, empowerment of Blacks, Latinos, women, gays. These groups have been locked out of City Hall. They might have jobs as janitors, but they or as garbage collectors, but they didn't have any of the higher jobs. Uh, under Richard J. Daley or his successors. So reform became the term throughout the 80s. Um, the term today is progressive. And the difference between a liberal and a progressive is essentially liberals tend to be in favor of government intervention, more government spending. Progressives tend to put that um, uh, into issues about uh, social transformation, um, racial equality, uh, cutting the income gap between the rich and the poor. Uh, so it's a sort of a more radicalized version of liberal. Well, Dick, one of the theme that is pervasive in your writing is corruption. And um, I went back into the Institute's records and saw um, the proceedings of a conference that my predecessor, David Yebsen, hosted, I think it was 12 years ago. Um, and the lead paper in that uh, packet of materials was written by you and several others. And I want to read a couple sentences and maybe have you reflect on how the world has changed in 12 years, if at all. You begin by saying, for a century and a half, Public corruption has been a shameful aspect of Illinois and Chicago politics. The governor's mansion and city Chicago city council chambers have long been the epicenters of public corruption. The extent and pervasiveness of bribery, fraud, stealing from taxpayers, and illegal patronage made the city and state national leaders of corruption. Our notorious reputation has provided fodder for scores of comedians and late late. Um, late night talk show hosts. And then you go on to say, you know, corruption is awful, but you say it's not funny. It's 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 expensive. And you put the number of, you know, corruption costing Illinois taxpayers at 500 million a year. So, I mean, I know the question that you've wrestled with for your entire career and it prior asked and almost every interview is, you know, why is Chicago as corrupt as it is? And why has Illinois had such uh, such struggles with corruption? So first, just to pin it to a few facts, since 1976, up to the latest Department of Justice uh, figures, we've had 2,224 uh, public officials in Illinois go to federal prison. They've been convicted in court. We know that they were corrupt. It was proven uh, before a jury or a judge. And uh, 1,800 of those, a little more, uh, were from the metropolitan Chicago region. But of course we had Blagojevich, we had the, the fine comptroller of Dixon, Illinois, who stole uh, more money than anybody knew the town had. Um, uh, their corruption case, East St. Louis, their cases all over the state of Illinois. Paul Powell was a famous uh, case when he was secretary of state. So first of all, Chicago is the most corrupt city. Illinois is the third most corrupt state in the country. And 
the question of why is actually relatively straightforward. Uh, we had political machines both in Chicago and downstate, uh, Democratic in Chicago, Republican in most of the areas downstate. And those political machines would create uh, patronage, nepotism, favoritism to voters. They would get favors, uh, city services, government services as favors, not uh, that they already were paying taxes for. And uh, people who voted the wrong way didn't get those services. And finally, there were crooked contracts, as the Tribune said a century and a half ago, with thievery written between the lines. Um, these things, so if you have a political machine, corruption is an automatic byproduct. You know, if it's okay for your brother-in-law to get a job because you're mayor, then what's the difference between an alderman taking an envelope of $500 to make a zoning change? Um, it becomes very difficult for the machine workers to tell the difference. Also, it corrupts the relationship between the citizens and the government. So as a citizen, I expect to pay you a bribe, and you as a government official expect me to give you a bribe to get things done. And that's just, as they say, that's the way it happens. That's the way it is. That's the way it's always been. Well, none of that is true. Um, but that's why corruption is so pervasive. The other places that have the most corruption, uh, places like Louisiana and New Jersey, have the same story. They had machine politics in some form, and that created the corruption uh, that makes them the other leaders of corruption in the United States. The, the issue of politi the political machine interests me, and I'm just wondering, at what point does a tough, hard-nosed, uh, kind of brutally efficient political operation tip over into a machine? I mean, is it leg illegality, or is there, I mean, how does one define a machine? Uh, so uh, we have a chart in, our, uh, in many of our publications, uh, not in all of them, um, and essentially, the traditional machines, say under Richard J. Daly, as recorded by books like uh, Mike Rothko's Boss or Milton Rakoff's several books on Chicago politics, what you have is first patronage. When you have patronage jobs, you're going to end up with a machine and it's going to be because the machine uses patronage, favoritism to individual voters and crooked contracts to get the resources it needs to win the election. With the favors, it's just buying the vote directly. With the patronage, it's creating precinct workers who get their jobs and are promoted based on their precinct work, not their government work. And the crooked contracts get them the money in terms of campaign contributions to overwhelm the opposition. Now, it's true reformers like myself can win from time to time, uh, but it's, it's pretty pervasive. It becomes a perpetual motion machine uh, and as they get positions and controlling the government, then they have the jobs, contracts, and favors to give out. Well, let's let's talk about Chicago mayors, because the book you have written this year, which is terrific, focuses on the last 40 years, primarily from Mayor Washington to Mayor Lightfoot, so 83 to 2023. But I, I want to talk for a minute about um, Richard J. Daley. And, and just a, a quick aside, we had, uh, a couple of years ago put together a publication about in which we asked 22 leading Illinoisans to, to recommend five books on Illinois history that they would recommend to students. You know, we asked uh, Governor Edgar, Senator Durbin, Speaker Welsh, and others. And I was going back of that report the other night, and I saw of the 22, seven of them had recommended books on um, Mayor Richard J. Daley, who's been, you know, was mayor for 21 years, but he's been gone for half a century. Why does he continue to exert such a kind of profound both fascination and relevance to um, to Illinois and Chicago politics? Uh, because the machine was perfected under Daly. Uh, before, if you go back before CERMAC uh, in the 30s, uh, there was no single machine. There were multiple machines in both the Democratic and Republican Party. There were essentially ward fiefdoms uh, with ward committeemen in charge. And in the city council, they had what were called rings where they would join together for their corrupt endeavors and shake down, say, 
Commonwealth Edison Company, uh, and then distribute their spoils among themselves. Uh, they were called the Gray Wolves. They split the spoils in the back rooms of City Hall. Um, so Richard Daly, uh, Cermak unified the Democratic Party. Uh, Richard J. Daly perfected the machine in the style that we've been describing. Um, and Richard J. Daly's policies were also profound. Uh, Richard J. Daly, on the positive side, did uh, bring back Chicago from a time when, uh, after World War II, when we were on industrial deindustrialization, industrial decline. Um, and he rebuilt the loop and he did things like that. He had a big planning effort for the first time in uh, so called modern Chicago history. And that pattern was then continued and changed under future mayors like Richard M. Daly, who changed the way the machine operated. We can talk about it if you want, but also made the city a spectacle and built the lakefront up, um, the museum campus, Millennium Park, was at the completion of the Navy Pier effort of renovation. Uh, McCormick Place, which his father had built, was rebuilt, um, and so on. Um, he also moved us towards becoming a global city, uh, or at least he presided over the period when we did become a global city in Chicago. So the Richard J. Daly forces got transmogrified or changed uh, over the time, but it is still the basic template if you want to. So when I do teach, uh, courses uh, often have them read uh, the book Boss by Mike Greco as a start to describe the daily machine. And then we go on to what has happened uh, in the 50 years since daily. Well, Dick, in your book, I mean, you talk about the sort of two kind of archetypes of, of Chicago mayors, and you refer to the um, establishment slash machine. And then the progressive, um, and let's 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 refer to maybe the first progressive, which is in your book, which um, who is Mayor Washington, Mayor Harold Washington. And I want to read a couple sentences you wrote, and then have you say a little bit more about Mayor Washington. Um, you said like this is he he enlisted you to join his campaign, and you say like most political observers, I didn't think he would win, but I did think it was a battle worth fighting. And then you went on to say you describe his term and you say the Harold Washington era was tumultuous and a controversial time. Beyond his specific accomplishments, Mayor Washington became a legendary figure who symbolizes what Chicago can become. His triumph still serves as an inspiration for those fighting future battles. For particularly for students who, who probably don't know very much about Harold Washington, why, why is he such an important figure in Chicago history? So first of all, it's significant. He was the first African-American to win uh, the mayor a position. And he was followed by Sawyer and then later by Lightfoot. Uh, but that was a real breakthrough. Uh, like I say, he ran on a three-part program. First, good government. And the good government reform happened the first day in office uh, when others and, not, uh, and I, who were part of the transition team, helped him fashion the Freedom of Information Ordinance. You have to realize that uh, freedom of information, government documents, was not a right uh, before the executive order. And then it got codified in his second term, uh, just before his second term in 1987, in the first ethics ordinance in the history of Chicago. And there are other examples of good government reforms under Harold. The second plank was, a for, uh, was affirmative action. Uh, before Harold, uh, there were virtually no important African Americans, women, uh, and uh, any of the other minority groups like Latinos or gays um, in positions of power. They, they would always be a token, even under Richard J. Daley, there'd be one or two blacks who would be in the cabinet, but everybody else would be all white, mostly all men. Um, even when Jane Byrne became mayor as a woman, she didn't appoint other women to positions of power. Uh, so this is a big break, and it meant uh, jobs, it meant contracts, it meant uh, that uh, he also had what was called balanced economic development, which was development of neighborhoods as well as the downtown. The third 
plank on this platform was neighborhood empowerment or and so community organizations rallied around Harold. They got him elected uh, when there were the battles and council wars. They came uh, on his side, and put pressure on the aldermen uh, to, uh, to enact what Harold was introducing. So Harold was really a forerunner in all the fields of reform. And what we say in the book is there's a progressive arc. There are the uh, building establishment mayors that I assume we'll talk about in a minute, but uh, the arc goes from Harold Washington. His program has continued under uh, Sawyer. Eugene Sawyer is a sort of forgotten Chicago mayor, but did better than is usually credited, all the way to Lori Lightfoot and today Brandon Johnson. So the arc is from progressive uh, to progressive. Establishment mayors are, are different. Uh, they're uh, often called builder mayors. So Richard M. Daly is a good example. Uh, building up the lakefront, uh, uh, straightening out some of the finances, ending the racial wars in the city council to some extent, um, calming the waters was the phrase that they used. So Daly was building things just like his father had been a builder mayor. And just like his father had, had the old Democratic Party, Richard M. Daly refashioned uh, his time to the daily volunteers, as they were called, the 5,000 patronage workers that worked in campaigns that daily wanted to, to have supported. So uh, there is this tension back and forth. You need both. You need to be able to build up the city. You need to keep some of the traditions and the past, but you also need fundamental reformers like Washington and Lightfoot. Well, just a quick aside on Washington. I remember speaking to the Speaker of the House, uh, Chris Welch, and he was saying that Harold Washington was his first political hero. And he remembers that the night that Washington died, coming home from school and sitting in front of the TV all night watching, you know, the kind of unfolding drama with the passing of Mayor Washington. So, uh, and I think Barack Obama has also said that he was deeply inspired by, by Mayor Washington. Yeah, Barack Obama came to Chicago as a community organizer, as opposed to staying in New York, uh, being a lawyer and so forth, his other choices that he could have had uh, because uh, of the inspiration of the Washington era. Washington was already dead by the time, here, by the time Barack got here, uh, but Barack Obama was brought here. A number of the key African-American leaders uh, in the state and in the country uh, were inspired by the Washington example. So it had effects that rippled across the nation. Well, in this 40 year period that you describe, you know, for roughly 30 years, it's been ruled by the establishment mayors. And as you said, Richie, Richie Daly, who served for 22 years, his father 21. So maybe a little father son rivalry there. But uh, Richie Daly was there for 22 years and then uh, Rahm Emanuel for eight years. Um, so as you, you know, as you kind of look, pull back, I mean, both of those gentlemen are associated with, you know, revitalizing downtown Chicago, economic growth, you know, pushing Chicago into the global, the global uh, marketplace, as it were. Um, you know, how do you judge the legacy of those two? Well, you, you give credit where credit is due. The authors of our chapter on uh, Richard M. Daly, uh, use the phrase, the city of spectacle. He built up the city, it increased the tourism and conventions. He did make us a global city. Um, he was able to reverse his father's bad image with the 68 convention and holding the 1996 Democratic National Convention. So there were a number of positive things, but the, one of the most remarkable things is that once he left office, he essentially disappeared. Um, he doesn't advise anyone. He doesn't, uh, uh, he's not, a, if you think of someone like Jimmy Carter's former president, uh, nearly all the former presidents have been involved in one form or another of major public endeavors of charity or in the case of Carter with the Carter Center and the, and the elections around the world. Uh, Richard M. Daly has become entirely private, um, and that's surprising, but uh, he did make a major contribution to the city. Rahm Emanuel essentially continued that, and Rahm Emanuel 
moved us towards being a tech city. Uh, he he uh, brought in uh, uh, the innovators in the technical fields, uh, computing area, uh, and all of the modern efforts uh, towards AI and the rest. Uh, those happened under a manual. So the, the downside, for instance, with a manual is pretty clear. He closed the six mental health clinics. He closed 50 public schools. Um, he was called uh, the mayor 1%. That is, he was said to be ruling for the 1% of Chicagoans that were rich and not the 99% who weren't. Um, and that's a, a fairly uh, honest criticism of him as long as you remember the good things that he did. Well, Lori Lightfoot, I, I know she she uh, is a friend of yours and you you worked on her campaign, um, you know, strikes many of us downstate who've, who've watched from a distance is, is a real mystery. I mean, as you point out in 79, excuse me, when in 2019, when she was first elected, she won 74 percent of the vote, won all 50 wards. Four year later, four years later, you know, she was defeated in the primary with, you know, less than 17 percent of the vote. Obviously, COVID was huge, utterly disruptive of Chicago and, and, and American life for that matter. So talk a little bit about Whitefoot's time and also something that I had not realized until I read your book, which was this initiative that um, that that was pioneered during her term called the We Will Chicago Plan, which is an attempt for kind of some broad strategic thinking for Chicago's future, you know, akin to the, the Burnham Plan of, of 1909. Yeah, so Lori Lightfoot, I think, will be... Uh remembered historically as uh, a, a very important mayor, first, first for continuing the Harold Washington traditions. The first day she was in office, she signed an executive order which outlawed automatic privilege or automatic prerogative where Alderman got to veto any services or zoning changes uh, in their own wards. Um, and that was a step forward in ethics. She increased the powers of inspector general, rewrote the ethics ordinance, I think three times, but is also remembered as a, uh, it will be remembered as a progressive. Her signature program was in Best Southwest, which are the poorest neighborhoods of Chicago on the South and West sides. They're basically all African-American. There are a few that are Latino. Um, and those have been systematically overlooked essentially since Harold Washington's balanced economic development. So she's continuing in the same direction as Washington, but with a much larger financial investment in these neighborhoods uh, to uh, try and make them uh, safe, try and make them economically resilient, to have jobs for people uh, in those neighborhoods. This is a major transformation. This is not being done, for instance, in the United States writ broadly. Um, so there are many other things. Her transition team uh, was much broader than any previous transition team. Both she and Brandon Johnson had about 400 members on their transition teams. Uh, before, when I was on the transition teams, there were a couple dozen of us, and some 50 students doing some research for us. Um, but this is a, a, a vast new, more inclusive process of plotting the future. And the We Will Plan, which was adopted in 2023, is essentially a continuation of the dreaming that had happened under the transition uh, team for uh, Lightfoot and Brandon Johnson's transition team uh, continued in the same direction, a very progressive document. Okay. Dick, let's go to some questions that have been emailed in. And the first one actually pertains to, uh, to Mayor Johnson. Um, and the question is, to what extent does Mayor Brandon Johnson's election provide optimism about the decline of machine politics? Also, please provide your assessment of Mayor Johnson's performance one year into his tenure. Well, so first of all, it's useful to go back to what we said about the machine originally. Patronage jobs was a mainstay of the machine. Under Richard J. Daley and court decisions, the Shackman decrees, um, the testimony was there were 35,000 patronage jobs in local government, which meant there were 35,000 precinct workers uh, available 
uh, to uh, work the precincts to get the machine candidates reelected. Fast forward to Richard M. Daly and the Sorich case, and we find out there are 5,000 people on the uh, uh, Sorich list for patronage hires where someone has recommended Joe Smith to become garbage collector or whatever. Um, that's a big drop, and that drop has continued ever since. So by the time we get to Brandon Johnson, there are the thousand or so positions that are Shackman exempt, where it's your policymakers or um, the secretary is directly for the mayor or other people. Uh, but we have essentially a, a vast decrease of patronage. So that um, this has meant that the, a continual decline of the Democratic machine. Frequently these days, the Cook County Democratic Central Committee, which is aptly named after the Soviet Union, I think, um, really does not even endorse many candidates. Now, Republicans don't really exist in Chicago other than in national elections, but uh, the Democratic machine is not the powerhouse it was. Frequently, reformers, say, for instance, someone like Franz Kigi, who is the county assessor, is able to run against the machine even in lower level offices and defeat them. Uh, the number of uh, aldermen who've been elected uh, outside of machine control has grown steadily. Uh, the Progressive Caucus is now somewhere between 18 and 20 members out of the 50. Uh, and there are other liberals who uh, oppose the machine who got elected as well. So I would say there's a majority of the city council that are not machine aldermen. Uh, at this stage. And that's a big transformation. Like I say, when I was alderman, the, the best we ever got to was seven members of the opposition block. And by the Blandic terms, only three members were in the city council uh, uh, as part of the opposition block. So that's, that's a fairly vast transformation. As to how Johnson has done, Mayor Johnson has been much slower than the previous mayors. For instance, Lori Lightfoot's transition team had reported before she was sworn in in May. Brandon Johnson's transition team didn't report for two months after he was mayor. In the first hundred days, uh, Lightfoot uh, reconvened her transition team and reported that about a third or more of the issues that the transition team had raised had already been enacted. Brandon Johnson at 100 days in had still not appointed his cabinet. Uh, his cabinet is still being appointed. It's mostly appointed now. Johnson has managed to win certain key events. One, uh, he was able to reorganize the city council the way he wanted. And two, he was able to pass his budget. In all but two votes in the city council, which are real outliers, uh, Johnson has managed to get 30 votes to pass the legislation he wanted. That is, there are different combinations of aldermen now that uh, might oppose a particular issue, but he has a strong majority, which unlike Harold Washington when he faced the council wars and had the majority on the other side, has meant that Johnson can get his policies through. Perhaps the biggest um, policy that's happened is the passage of the Bring Chicago Home Ordinance, which is an increase in the real estate transaction tax that would bring $100 million into uh, uh, dedicated to ending homelessness and providing affordable housing in Chicago each year. Uh, there have been other areas that are uh, where he has not been able to succeed in his first year. Um, he said in his campaign, it would take $800 million to be able to implement the progressive social reforms he wanted. Uh, and in his first budget, for instance, instead of replacing the six mental health clinics, he was able to replace only two. His answer for that is that's a down to payment and over the years he will complete uh, the kinds of promises he made in his campaign. What do you make of his, um public tensions with the governor. They seem to be, I know there's a historic uh, tension between the governor of Illinois and um, the mayor of Chicago, even when they're in the same parties, but it feels like uh, Pritzker and um, the mayor communicate an awful lot through public uh, 
reprimands rather than private negotiations. Although I think they met actually yesterday with them. Um, with others. So what is your your sense of that relationship? Uh, it is a tense relationship, um, more than it ought to be. Partly it's because of their different agendas. Uh, Brandon Johnson needs a lot of state money, for instance, for the migrant crisis, or the asylum seeker crisis. And uh, on the other hand, uh, Pritzker is willing to give some money, but not what Brandon wants. Um, uh, Pritzker wants to be president of the United States. Brandon wants to be mayor of the city of Chicago. And the path that each needs to be successful in their goal is very it, is not the same always. The, on many things, they do agree. You know, they'd like to both have a successful Democratic National Convention here this summer. They would like to solve the migrant or immigration or asylum seeker problem, uh, but they they get at it a different way. So for instance, the state withdrew some money uh, that was planned for a tent that Brandon had planned to house a thousand migrants in. Um, it's not a matter of who was right or wrong in that. It's just that they come at the problems They have a different constituency. They have a different agenda that they've articulated. You might think of, uh, the governor uh, as being a liberal and Brandon as being a progressive. If they're fighting Trump, then they're both on the same side. If they're fighting to solve the asylum seeker problem, they have uh, different goals. Very interesting. Second, another question is, uh, pertains to the trial of Alderman Burke and asking what your, your assessment of that trial is and also what your thoughts are about uh, former Speaker Matt against upcoming trial? Um, so just to preface, there are three major corruption circles or trials or sets of trials going on currently. Uh, the first is the, the Chicago Alderman Burke, Solis, and others uh, who are being convicted. And Burke was convicted on 13 of the 14 counts. Um, he, it was clearly proven that he was shaking down businessmen, both to support uh, political candidates and to provide his law firm uh, with clients. Um, so the, he's the 38th alderman uh, to be convicted of public corruption since 1976, uh, since 1972. So that's, we only have 50 members in our city council. We've only had 200 aldermen probably in the whole period. That's a lot, um, you know, as I sometimes say, that's a bigger crime wave than uh, in the worst ghetto in Chicago. The second set that have been going on are the Commonwealth Edison, Madigan state legislators. There's new trials starting now with some of the other figures in that um, conspiracy. Um, and the Madigan trial will be central to that. And uh, but already the people from Commonwealth Edison have been convicted and a number of Madigan associates, uh, including Mapes, have been convicted. So that's the second level, which is run essentially out of the state legislature. The third circle of corruption trials are in the Chicago suburban region, and those involve state legislators and mayors. Essentially, state legislators go to mayors and say, hey, we'll give you a big bribe if you'll let in this red light camera company that will collect a lot of fees from speeders past red lights or in general. Uh, and this is gonna be profitable for everybody. And those trials are ongoing. There've been a number of convictions. It looks like they're going to be a lot more. You know, partly the trials on corruption have speeded up because in the COVID period, it was impossible to bring cases. The courts were essentially closed, particularly for major, uh, cases like the corruption cases. And then now, the, the, the Madigan case, is there a Supreme Court um, uh, case that might have an effect on, on Speaker Madigan's trial? Yes, there, and it could affect the Burke sentencing as well. Um, the federal or U.S. Supreme Court case, and the Supreme Court, I have to say, has been um, a problem. Uh, in the corruption area. Essentially what the Supreme Court has said is that um, 
corruption only occurs if there's an exact quid pro quo. Uh, you're a state legislator. I offer you a bribe to uh, to carry Bill 1327 for me. And, you know, I actually give you money and you actually vote yes on 1327 and handle it in the committee and so forth. Uh, the Supreme Court will probably continue to hold that that kind of uh, event is indeed corruption. But when you get to more uh, to broader areas of corruption, campaign contributions of, um, you know, um, cases where you've given me a lot of money because you know I'm going to vote the way you want on utility regulation. And that, so the utilities give as Commonwealth Edison did, huge amounts of money to people who are going to uh, vote on bills that will give them profit. Uh, but they never said, we want you to vote on 1327. Uh, that will become problematic for both uh, the actual sentencing and possibly the retrial of Burke and uh, certainly cases like the Madigan case. Well, Dick, let's talk a little bit about just your writing. I mean, you, you've been prolific. You've uh, 22, 23 books. Um, let's just talk about your writing process. Are you, um, is your head, and we're, we're, we're joking offline. You were saying, yeah, you thought the last book was your, going to be your final one, but you, you have another one in the works, which I'd like to talk about in just a second. But I mean, are you, um, are you kind of constantly wrestling with ideas and saying, man, this you know, maybe this would be a good short book. And if I can get it done, you know, in 2024, 25, talk about your writing process. And do you, when you start a project, are you just, you know, really focused on it for a specific time? Or is there, you know, various projects that are in various stages of completion? Uh, often there are various projects. For instance, when you do a book, you get to go through it and you publish it. Like with the university press, there's a peer review process. So it's out of your hands for a couple of months at a time. And this happens at least twice in the process. So, um, you know, for instance, the mayor's book was going on as I was finishing the publication of uh, Democracy's Rebirth. Um, I was doing copy editing and changes on Democracy's Rebirth, getting it published, doing uh, the speaking tours and stuff. Uh, at the same time, we were hard at work with the mayor's book, which had started with a, a number of us getting together for uh, a conference or talks at the U of I um, uh, back, I think it's six or seven years ago now. So yes, you do have multiple projects and sometimes there'll be interruptions. You will uh, dash off a quick op-ed uh, or something like it. Uh, you'll review books that other are sent to you uh, for, for you to peer review for other authors. Uh, so that it, it isn't a straight line if you're going to produce a lot of books because it can take up to five years to get a book, but there's a lot of downtime in between. Uh, secondly, every author I know has a set writing schedule. Um, you know, I uh, heard of one, uh, one of the best African-American authors in uh, Illinois history, who's not well known, Cyrus Coulter, head of the IC, the Illinois Commerce Commission, would get up at four in the morning and write before he took over, took his job at the ICC and rendered decisions on Commonwealth Edison rates. Um, and he was a novelist. Um, I was down at Hemingway's house in um, Key West. Hemingway uh, would get up early in the morning, I can't remember, maybe six o'clock, and would, uh, you know, have a brief breakfast, go out to his study, which was sort of a coach house uh, on the property, uh, would write for several hours at 11 o'clock or so, he would finish writing, go swimming, have lunch, and go out fishing and drinking for the rest of the day. Um, writers don't write 100% of the time, you don't write all day long, um, maybe if you're on some part of the process like copy editing, you might. But and normally you write for a certain number of hours and you write at roughly the same kind of time. And if you don't write, um, then you sort of feel like a loss. Hey, I'm supposed to be writing. It's, you know, nine o'clock. I'm supposed to be, you know, writing at my computer. And it's amazing if you write um, five pages a day, 
double spaced. Um, you'll certainly have a book out and you'll certainly finish the manuscript for a book in a year. Well, let's let's talk about your films. I know you've you've participated in seven or eight films. What um, what uh, how does that process work for you? So in those films, I was um, essentially producer, political advisor. So the first film we did was uh, well, the second one. The first one was related to course material, um, and was simply more or less an illustrated version of lectures. But the first real documentary film was called By the People. And I was part of the Bernie Weisberg uh, campaign for Illinois Convention delegate in 69. And my job, uh, so I was, as producer, I had to get the money from the university to make the film. I used a university crew of very talented people. Unfortunately, we no longer have those crews at any of our universities to be able to do them in-house. But at the time we did, and um, I would say, well, we're, you know, we're going to be passing out leaflets at such and such an address, or there's going to be a coffee for Bernie Weisberg at such and such a place, or we know that the opponent is speaking over here, and I could send the film crew there. I wasn't necessarily with the film crew. I wasn't the director. I wasn't holding the camera or the mic. Um, I didn't do the final editing, although I had a voice in, in whether or not what was being edited was going to work. Uh, and we were using Cinema Verite, uh, which is just straight, no narrator, uh, just the, the people on the film talking. In later films, we did use narrators because we had to do them for a replay on television, which was, means it have to be 28 minutes and 30 seconds long. And for those films to condense the, to make it work, you had to use a narrator. The first films we did were 90 minutes long. The later films for television were 28, 30, and those also worked for classrooms. So got multiple purposes out of uh, doing films. The reason to do films is to let the viewers sympathetically participate. And this goes back to my idea of teaching is you need to get the students to have a sense of what it's like to be in politics and government. And so films help do that. So it was part of my teaching process throughout. That was the motivation for going to making films rather than just writing books or lecturing. Okay. Well, Dick, final question. I, 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 I'm so interested in what you, your thought is on the future of Chicago. And we were talking offline, and I said, and I also asked if you had another book that you're working on, and you said you did. And I think this connects very much to your sort of thoughts about the future of Chicago. So tell us about this new project, and, and just give us your sense of where Chicago is now and where it may be unfolding in the coming coming decades. So the new book is called uh, Dreaming Chicago's Future. And it looks at about 50 people over, uh, well, it actually starts with the uh, dreams of the Native Americans who inhabited this land for 10,000 years. Uh, we have from about the 16th century on, but particularly by the 19th century and the 18th and 19th century, we have speeches and talks by Native American chiefs uh, related to like the Black Hawk War and some others, the key elements of uh, Illinois history. And so we include straight out planners like Daniel Burnham with his famous Chicago plan of 1909. People like Jane Addams and Hull House who aren't usually thought of as exactly dreamers, but the Hull House women actually went block by block, building by building and drew maps uh, they were attempting to describe what the conditions of poverty were so that analysis could be done as to what were the procedures. And they invented a large number of our current institutions. They created the, the play lots. There were no play lots in America before Jane Addams and the Hull House. They uh, created the juvenile justice system. Uh, they improved the schools. They, uh, she became uh, the garbage inspector for the ward she lived in in Hull House. Um, and then went on to other things like the Nobel Peace Prize for her role in progressive politics and anti-war 
uh, demonstrations. Uh, but there were others. Uh, there were uh, artists. There were uh, people who uh, were in music. There were uh, Richard J. Daly, as we talked about, was a, had a major role in replanning Chicago in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, I voted against some of his plans by the time I was older. Uh, but so we, in the book, talk about the, you know, the pros and cons of what they suggested. Did they succeed or not? Some ideas take decades to succeed. And uh, some never have so far come to fruition. And so this exploration of all the dreamers who, the visionaries, there's a, a passage in the Bible without vision of people perish. Uh, and so the theme of the book is to, what were the visions that people had? What are the visions we might have today for a better future? Great. And when do you expect that to come out? Is that a couple of years in the offing or? Yeah, it's publishing process is slow. I turn in the final manuscript copy of the entire book uh, this April. It'll probably take two years to come out, It'll probably be 2026. Well, I will be looking for it, and uh, maybe we can bring you down to Carbondale when that book comes out and talk about it, because we'd love to keep in track uh, with your work and and um, keep this conversation going. So it's been really a delight uh, visiting with you, Dick. Thank you. And, and I have to say that, you know, a lot of the themes, even though they're about Chicago, can be applied to Carbondale as well um, and to other places in the state that are smaller. You still need visionaries. You still need both builders and reformers. And uh, the tension between them can still be important. Perfect. Well, I look forward to meeting you in person, Dick. And thank you again for joining us. And thanks all of you for joining another edition of Illinois Authors. We'll have this on our website in the coming days. And please show it to family and friends and help us keep the memory of Paul Simon alive and well. Thank you so much.